Ahead on America This Week, 2020 lives up to its reputation as the nation continues to wait to find out who will be the next president. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. And it ain't over till every vote is counted. Every ballot is counted. You won't want to miss my conversation with former White House communications director turned Biden supporter Anthony Scaramucci. President Trump represents an avatar uh, for their anger. Anthony, and I, Anthony, I respect I'm, I'm that watching. and I get that. But he's, he's done a disastrous job as president, which is why uh, disastrous, he lost the popular disastrous. vote by seven you, or eight million Mr. people. Mr. Wall Street there, President Obama's former economic advisor, Professor Austin Goolsby, is also here. Well, if there's a blue wave, then we're going to get a whole bunch of stimulus. The markets seem to like that. Plus, I'm talking post-election balls and strikes with the national political reporter for The Washington Post, Amy Gardner. That's right now on America This Week. Tonight, there's still no clear winner in the presidential race. Now the Trump campaign says it's suing to temporarily stop the vote counts in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Georgia because they claim there's a lack of transparency. At this hour, the race still isn't called, but former Vice President Joe Biden is leading in electoral votes 264 to 214, according to the Associated Press. Sinclair's chief political correspondent, Scott Thuman, shows us the latest critical developments. All those yellow vests, workers in Pennsylvania counting ballots well into Wednesday morning. Same in Michigan, likewise in Wisconsin. But also work being done by countless attorneys, possibly with eyes on the Supreme Court, after President Trump alleged fraud and threatening to take his case to the high court. Joe Biden's team ready to counter. The Supreme Court has already weighed in, declining Republican requests to intervene with Pennsylvania's process of allowing mail-in ballots through Friday, as long as they were postmarked by Election Day. The beneficiary of mail-in voting is Joe Biden. From the very beginning, Democrats have been committed to mail-in voting. Uh, Republicans have been downplaying it and skeptical of it. Partly, I think the Biden campaign made a tactical decision early on. They thought people would be afraid to go and vote in person. Turned out that wasn't the case. Maybe a reason that President Trump said in the overnight hours the voting should stop. The president really does not have a legal leg to stand on. I, I don't see plausible legal claims. That doesn't mean the Trump campaign can't go into court with implausible, even frivolous claims. And it may take some number of days to sift through that for judges to work through that. As if that weren't complicated enough, the president's team announced Wednesday it's now demanding a recount in Wisconsin, citing irregularities that raise, quote, serious doubts. Meanwhile, if you've heard people use the phrase a red mirage, this is what they're talking about, that in-person election day voting gives Republicans a noteworthy lead in some states. But as those mail-in ballots are collected and tabulated, that advantage simply disappears. And you see the difference, although still too early to tell if that's happening in some areas. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. And thank you, Scott, for that report. There's a lot to dissect with this election. Boy, isn't that true. Let's hear from both sides of the aisle with Sinclair political commentator Amisha Cross and member of the president's National Security Education Board, host of America First on Salem Radio and Sinclair Media contributor Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Before we get to you guys, this happened a couple hours ago. The Trump campaign is clearly, clearly going to take this, going to put this in the hands of the lawyers. Take a listen to Eric Trump earlier. We've declared victory in Pennsylvania. We're up by 400,000 votes with 86% of the precincts in. 86% we have Republican votes still coming in from Trump country. And the Democrats know that the only way that they could win this election is to cheat in Pennsylvania. And we've seen it from day one. We've seen it from day one. We found ballots in drainage ditches. They're not letting our poll watchers watch the polls. They're not letting them inside. There's video after video of them passing out collateral material in polling sites all over Philadelphia. They're trying to cheat. They're trying to cheat. All right, Sebastian, let's go to you first on this. I, I, leading into this, you know, all this talk about cheating and voter fraud, 
it bothered me. It felt like this is some sort of way of easing the, the, the impact if one side or the other, both said it might be happening, one side or the other lost. But this really feels odd. Uh, I'll give you one more statistic. In Wisconsin, the, the numbers are in, almost 90% of the electorate voted. That's almost statistically impossible, Sebastian. Yeah, look, let's look at the things that we already know, Eric. Uh, just today, we hear, heard the news of two United States postal workers arrested for destroying, um, destroying mail-in ballots. We have the recent case in Texas where three Democrat Party officials were charged with 30 nine felonies 39 felonies in one case of election tampering and election fraud we just want to ensure one thing you've played the sort you played the, the the clip of joe biden saying all votes must be counted no joe biden only the legitimate votes should be counted what kind of country do we live in eric is this outer mongolia is this turkmenistan where four count them four states are going trending towards the president to the incumbent and then in the middle of the counting last night they stop counting them what does everybody go to bed at 9 30 in pennsylvania it's a joke we are the only nation to put 12 men on the moon six united states flags are on the moon but but we have to stop counting it's at 9 30. there's only one reason that the counting stopped because the president was winning and, and Amisha, what do you what do you think? What do you? I'll let you respond to that. But it really does bother me as an American. 330 or 40 million people here, the most prosperous nation on the planet, 20 trillion dollar GDP economy, and we're still playing. We can't we can't count a ballot. We can't count ballots. Well, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing from your side of the aisle. Well, the ballots are being counted. And just last night, we heard President Trump declare a victory where he could not declare one. All of the ballots, there were still millions of ballots left un uncounted or in Pennsylvania specifically. And we saw him, you know, call out states uh, before any news organization was calling them out. This is the same president who also argued that, you know, there was a extreme amount of voter fraud trying to stop people from early voting, trying to stop people from mail-in ballots. What we know is that all of Trump's rhetoric around the dangers of mail-in ballots and early voting only pushed Democrats to get out and do it more. So we knew, Democrats knew and weren't extremely afraid. The Biden campaign knew and wasn't extremely afraid. You know, that once but, those but votes Amisha, were counted, but, but, that things would start to but, change. And as I told you yesterday, the Midwestern states were going to be the core for yeah, Joe but, but, Biden. But, but, and we Amisha, saw that with just the hear me out. Wisconsin. Hear me out here. So last night, when the voting was when the voting stopped for some odd reason, good people didn't want to work. Even though we we, we wait four years to elect the most <laughs> powerful human being on the planet, uh, to 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 clearly the most important job on the planet. But we're going to take the night off from counting votes. President Trump had about a six or seven hundred thousand vote lead. Now, whether there's funny business or not going on, I don't know. I'm not there. I will tell you, though, it opens up the possibility for it, and it certainly opens up the suspicious side of the people who are losing will suspect the people who are willing, uh, winning of shenanigans. It, what, well, why we why do we do this? Why don't we just <laughs> stop voting at midnight on November 3rd or first Tuesday after the, fir the Tuesday after the first Monday? of every fourth year. Well, we did stop voting. We didn't stop counting the ballots. I think that we had we had a President Trump last night who literally called out, then tweeted about wanting the ballot counts to be stopped when he felt like he was up and winning before other counties came in. So this is a president who's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. It's just like a football, a football team, a football coach calling the end of a game after there's the first touchdown. No, you can't I, no, do that. No, we no, wait I'm not giving you that. End. I'm not giving you that because when that clock stops and the bell buzzer rings, the game is over. Sebastian, it's more like this, that stupid game soccer that they play in England. You think the game is over, and then the referees have a secret extra time, and no one in the stadium knows when the game's over. That's what it feels like here. Maybe the game's over after the other team catches up. I played rugby, a real man sport. <laughs> uh, look, l let's be clear here. Misha's being disingenuous. The president didn't say, stop all counting now. He said, stop the counting by Democrat officials in Democrat states that have refused. Let's remember what has happened in Pennsylvania. They have refused to allow the legally mandated outside observers to come and watch the counting. What have you got to hide, Pennsylvania? Why won't you allow the legally mandated officials to watch the count? Because you want to steal it. It's, an, it's as outrageous as what happened at, what was it, 11 o'clock at night? 
when Fox calls Arizona with 650,000 votes out uh, not counted yet. This is a mockery of our republic and it's got to stop and the people who are cheating it, have got to be it, identified. And again, Amisha, I'm, gonna, I'm not saying that any, any funny business is going on, but it does seem odd and it opens it up for scrutiny when the four states that are really slow walking this have been uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And guess what? All Democrat governors. Yeah. These are states that have some of the highest early vote and ballot totals that we've seen across the country and the highest level of percentage of those who are actually voting that this nation has ever seen. So none of this is actually surprising. These are very large states with hundreds of thousands of people who are voting for the very first time. This isn't surprising. This is a mark of an America that's tired of the status quo and wants to see Trump out. So Every why can Florida do it? Count. Why, right, can, we, why can Florida do it? A much larger state. 930, we got the results. How can Florida do it? Florida wasn't gonna, close. Listen, let's, I'll tell you what. That's a good tease for the panel coming back later in the show. Be right back with the panel. Former White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci joins me. And, and if for those who watch the show regularly, you know Anthony I, and I have a bet on who's going to be the president starting January 21. I say Trump. Anthony says it's Joe Biden. And I think Anthony's coming on to concede the victory to me. Is that right, Anthony? Yeah, right. Okay, listen, I'll be ordering caviar. There's going to be Cristal <laughs> champagne. It's going on your black American Express card. I mean, you are so done here. It's not even funny. And by the way, like me, you're a fellow trader, so you're looking at the futures markets. You know it's impossible to get this thing done now. The president is already telling his buddies about campaigning stop, stop. and running for president stop. in 2020. Did you say it's impossible to get this thing done? As for, so our audience impossible. knows we're taping this yeah. at, at 3.35 on Wednesday afternoon. This yeah. is still anyone's race. There are still paths to victory for either candidate. So I'll say it again, Mooch. I'll say it again. You remember the big headline, Dewey defeats Truman. They printed it because they had they, they had a deadline to print it to get the newspaper out the next morning. Truman won when they woke up. So we may wake up, or when this finally does air, you, my friend, okay. may be buying me caviar and champagne. No, no, this is going to be delicious caviar on your bill. I, I, you know what? And here's the other thing I want to stipulate for this. I don't like caviar, I by the way. The, so. I, I, I like it. I want to see the waiter hand you the bill so I can see the you know large check. And make sure you tip these people properly, Eric, because you're a very rich guy. So this is what we do on the right, Anthony. You may not, you lefty liberals on the left don't do that, but we on no, the right, I'm, we I'm tip a, well. We take care long of people. Time, long we, time conservative. I'm just not a Trumpist, which is an, it was a disavowal of You, my friend, have to turn in your conservative man card because you are no longer conservative if you are pushing for the guy no, I, who I'm put not conservative for judges into seats across no, the not, country, included, not including for three and a half billion Supreme dollar Court. deficit spending. I'm not for racist invective on Twitter. I'm not for a disavowal of our allies. I'm not for lying about science. I'm not for politicizing wears, mask wearing. I'm not for destroying the U.S. economy due to my lack of crisis management skills and the bellicosity of my rhetoric and the incendiary nonsense. However, all of those things aside, I do want to congratulate the president on getting a very large popular vote total. Let's talk honestly he got the second largest vote total in U.S. history. It was bigger than the Obama vote total in 2008. And so to the president's credit, there's something systemically going wrong in our country right now, Eric. There's a lot of disaffected people, a lot of unhappy people, and we have to fix that. Whether you're from the left or the right, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, there's a lot of people, Eric, that feel economically desperate in our society. They feel left out of the system, and we have to figure that out. And, and we can't literally say who the president is right now again Wednesday 335. I will tell you at 337, I will tell you what we can say definitively, Anthony, that this big, massive blue wave that, that people were calling for, I'm not sure if you're a blue waver or not, but people are calling for, I think you may have. You may have said that because of Trump, mm -hmm. the, the, the Republicans were going to lose the Senate and there's going to be a wider No, uh, I, I didn't say that. I, I got in, it in wrong, House. however. Well, I'm everyone did. Everyone I got did. it wrong. There, there, I, I, I thought Trump was going to get annihilated. And what Trump is explaining to people is that the people are so unhappy in the country uh, that they're really trying to send, send an anti-establishment message by voting for President Trump. And, and I have to respect that. And as I said, I, I applaud him for that vote total.
You know, I, I and I sit here and you're a friend of mine and, and I look at some of these, what, what do you guys, Link, Lincoln Logs, what do you, Lincoln Project, whatever that, that group is, basically Republicans in name only, rhinos. It just drives me crazy because you guys got together, you're all pro-Trump, you're all conservative, you're all GOPers, and you took this guy, you, you know, or we don't know yet, but you're, you, you just went at it. You just kept axing the tree, it's axing the tree, and whether the Trump tree falls or not, it remains to be seen, but but man, that is not good for the Republican Party or conservatism across America. Well, no, no, no most, this is where we'll intellectually disagree. It most certainly is. Uh, Trumpism is a demagogic distortion of conservatism Anthony, and the Republican Party. And could so, be 70 so he, million people voted for the guy, 68 million as we cor- speak, right? It could be cor- 70 correct. million it's a, people it's a, it's a It's a specter of danger, uh, populism and nationalism, and the rise of those sorts of things never end well in history. And so, if those people are well treated by the system and they feel that they have an opportunity, they won't be voting for people that send out racist invective on their Twitter feed. They'll vote for their own peace and prosperity. Mr. Trump represents, President Trump represents an avatar. Uh, for their anger, Anthony, and I, Anthony, I respect I'm, I'm that, watching. and I get that. But he's, he's done a disastrous job as president, which is why uh, disastrous. He lost the popular disastrous. vote by seven you, or eight million Mr. people. You, Mr. Wall Street, there, you want to call it disastrous? The man brought America to the highest economic growth, the lowest unemployment rates in history, and then <laughs> the, this this <laughs> virus that. I hope that's not what COVID. About this about virus that that, t- to that took the, the legs out of the economy, it comes roaring back as soon as things start getting better. He mishandled the virus, and by the way, it did go up 33% because it fell off a cliff. It was like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel uh, because he wouldn't listen to the epidemiology. He wouldn't listen to the scientists. He's, you know, come on. And, you know, this is one thing I do with respect about you. When I go on Fox News now, they interrupt me after 30 seconds. You at least give me 45 seconds. So I'm, like, literally hugging you through the uh, Zoom call here. Yeah, well... But, yeah, you you but, at least but, let me speak. But, but I, I look, admire that. Low unemployment you. among minorities. Low unemployment. Most Americans working in the history of the country just, just not, under but just President not, Trump. Good Lord. I mean, just not how true. do you he not He destroyed all that? of that let me do this. of let, the let, way let, he handled the presidency. He's let, the responsible person for the destruction of the U.S. economy. Uh, not China? Responsible person. Not a China virus? You're going to blame oh, it no, on no, Trump? No, 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 no. The South Korean economy Who's, who's is the blame booming. for the destruction 20, of the Italian economy? Or the, or the g- Greek e- economy? Or the German economy? Or the no, British economy? No, the Greek economy, economy is flourishing. It's, the, it's, the German economy is doing quite well. The Chinese economy is actually uh, beginning a boom and a, a oh, major yeah, resurgence. Yeah, yeah, at the all expense of, that, of the rest of the of world, that. Anthony, because guess what happened? No, because we guess what? They the exported virus. that virus and they hoarded PPE going into that whole thing. Stop it. We have it on record. We know this. Ask Peter Navarro. Hold on. I, let me just do this. Uh, do, okay, let's I'll, flip I'll this. Sure let's ask Peter the next time I speak to him, but let me put it to you this way. They mishandled it at the White House. They mishandled it and they created the steepest recession since the Depression. No one created and, and a recession. I, and I will no say created, this to you. you know had they not done recession. that, it would have been a lot easier. You know what created a recession? recession? People dying left and right because of a virus that Trump had not. You didn't have anything to do with it. Biden had nothing to do with it. And Trump certainly didn't have you anything to do it. with you the virus. You could have handled it in the same protocol and procedures that South Korea did. That was the epidemiological South, recommendation. You're, you're comparing that was the 320 million people with $21 trillion economy GDP to South Korea? Oh, come on, Anthony, stop. I, let's just do this. Here's what I want to well, do. No, I want to talk their about per capita the GDP military. is almost near ours now, actually. And yes, I am comparing that because they listen to the science. Their economy is booming. They're out of the crisis. We're in the heart of the crisis. We have 70 or 80,000 people getting infected a day, 1,200 people dying a day. And I got to tell you, that is a lasting achievement of President Trump, that he was able to have super spreader events all over the country. Stanford University said he killed seven hundred people Anthony. in these latest Anthony. super spreader events, Mooch. thirty thousand new infections. Mooch. 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 And Mooch. Mooch. still able Mooch. to get that ma- amount Mooch. of popular vote. I, I, I applaud him for that. The, the, the death rate the death rate is actually plummeting down. The number of people dying is flat while t- cases are going up. You and I are both wearing flag pins. We respect the flag. You got 12, we respect the flag. We respect our military. Died yesterday, Eric. We res- and it, it's been about a thousand for about three months. It's, we respect the flag. We respect our military. Don't make right? light of it, though, man. Come on, you know. Come on, it's a thousand families. You know, people. I'm not. That die I'm not families. downplaying don't, that. Don't I'm saying you can you can quote a hundred thousand cases, but if the death if the number of deaths is is flat, that means the, the you, you, I'll do the math for you. 
the numerator stays the same, the denominator gets bigger, guess what? The ratio goes down, that's, that's the math. Anthony, we're wearing flag pins. We respect the military, we respect the country, we respect the flag. President Trump stood up for the military. He pushed back against the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball for kneeling for that flag. I watched the returns on election night with Navy SEALs, a group of Navy SEALs. 100% of them were pro-Trump. How do you push, how do you walk away from that? Me? Yeah. Yeah, the guy went after my wife on Twitter. You're not allowed to do that to a guy like me. Do I look like Ted Cruz to you? Do I look like Rand Paul? A little. Okay. No, no, I'm not. Well, I'll just so you know, the last six months, my actions would dictate otherwise. You're not going after my wife after I raised you and is gave that, is you that what this millions is about, of Mooch? dollars. Is that what this is about? Is what this are you a talking personal about? vendetta with the president? It, it, I mean, is it, that what It is a combination of things. Because I'm looking at a guy go, who comes from Wall Street, Street who is a patriotic American. I think he's All the things that president. should be important you know, to Mooch. Go ahead, you talk. It's your show. Correct. All the things that should be important to you. Lower taxes, lower regulations, strong military, keeping our country safe. Those should those be things. important to you, but you're pushing them away because a guy said something nasty about your wife, who I love, oh, who's a beautiful woman, and I love. Who, 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 but by that's the way, not you're, not allowed, you're not allowed to. I raised the guy millions of dollars. I gave him seven figures. I worked for him for over a year, hundreds of hours of media advocacy. Do not attack my wife on the presidential Twitter feed. I don't know MAGA guys who are in the middle of the country that say, oh, that was a good idea, that's something he should do, and that's an appropriate I, thing. Are I got, you equivocating on this television show and saying that that was an appropriate thing for President Trump to do, to attack my suburban housewife on Twitter when he knew that her and I were almost divorced as a result of me working for him? Are you saying on the television right now that that was an appropriate thing? I said the thing? opposite. I said your wife's okay. a beautiful person, okay. and, and okay. I know her, and okay. I love so her. And, a, and that has nothing an, to do with the politics. He's a disgusting sort of a guy, right. and he's leaving the White House right. on January 20th, he and that'll may be, be a very good day he, for America, he, and it'll be a very he, good day he, for the Republican Anthony, Party. he may or may not be leaving on January 20th, but if he is leaving, I attributed that to these, these r rhino Republicans like you and those Lincoln Project idiots and and, and thank you. Cindy McCain Cindy McCain thank you. Yes. may be singly uh, responsible I, for I, I like Arizona. my heroes coming back from the dead I like my heroes coming back back from the dead to defeat demagoguery that's how I like my heroes. I rebuilt the like military Anthony uncaptured ISIS you might who. like your heroes uncaptured. ISIS who. ISIS I like ISIS mine who. coming back from the dead to defeat demagoguery ISIS who. I, listen Mooch we'll, we'll figure it out over dinner me right. or you paying Caviar we'll man and his crystal and you better tip these people Eric I'll, I expect uh, very big tip from you because you are loaded I'll, I'll these people them. are in the middle class I'll and I'm expecting you to close the gap Eric that's what you're about man close the gap mooch everybody welcome back uh, to the former member of the European Parliament and leader of the Brexit party, Nigel Farage. Nigel, thank you for joining us. You know, Nigel, we were sitting there, we were watching the returns in that room, and it looked like the, the, the President Trump was doing very, very well. I will tell you, when Arizona flipped from what should have been a, a, what everyone thought was going to be a President Trump win, I don't even know if it flipped, but Fox News called it fairly early. The room really changed. Tell us what you, what do you, what do you think? What are you seeing? Yeah, I was with you. I mean, I absolutely, it all felt slightly euphoric almost, didn't it? Uh, and then Fox calls Arizona for Biden. Uh, goodness knows why they did or why they chose to do it at that time. Um, and then, yeah, ever since then, it's been a complete and utter nail biter. Uh, sadly, um, I predicted much of this back in August. I said that on the day, on the vote, the president would win and win comfortably, but that there was a massive problem with postal voting. Let me tell you why I said that back in August. Tony Blair introduced widespread postal voting in England 20 years ago. Since that time, we haven't just seen fraud. We haven't just seen intimidation. We've seen problems with the verification of those that get the postal votes. And person after person goes to prison. So postal voting is open for abuse. And I always feared that would happen. Now, if it turns out that Joe Biden has won this fairly and squarely, there's no argument. But if the president can prove, if he can prove that there's been fraud, there's been intimidation, there have been postal votes sent out, for example, to dead people, if the president can prove that, uh, then we could be in for some of the most difficult few weeks 
uh, that America has ever faced. Yeah, you know, it, it blows me away. The, the representational democracy that America is is the best political system on the planet, bar none. And, and you can weigh in on that being from, from England. But, but also, we have some of the best technology on the planet as well. It just blows me away that in 2020, we're still worrying about paper ballots being thrown in ditches, whether or not things are postmarked on time, and whether or not we can read the proper signature on, on a, a piece of paper. How are we so power, so big, and yet so incapable of, of, of seemingly putting on a fair election? Well, I guess it's because state by state, you know, they're in charge of the ballots. And there isn't, there doesn't seem to be to me, you know, enough of a federal set of guidelines by which people should behave. I've no doubt some states would have conducted this perfectly well. Other states won't have done. So some sort of degree here, some degree of all working in step would be good. I also, Eric, find it unbelievable that you could post your vote yesterday with a stamp mark that said it was before five o'clock and that vote arrives today or arrives tomorrow and can still be counted. I mean, that clearly is absolutely ludicrous. And I, I must say this, that in the first two years of the Trump presidency, the Republican Party machine should have made sure that it got legislation through Congress to make sure that voting was fair and probably done in this country, and it never even tried to do so. And now I feel it is paying a price. You know, and you look at some of the states that have pushed back for what you point out, postal voting or mail-in voting, as we say here. Yeah. Uh, Democrat governors, look at Pennsylvania, look at North Carolina, look at Michigan, look at Wisconsin. Why is it that the Democrat states, the governors ah. of Democrat states, are ah. all pushing for this really antiquated system of voting and counting, and, and counting the votes? It's very simple. The left are better at cheating than the right. <laughs> and they know it works to their advantage. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen the Labour Party doing this in the United Kingdom. You know, I mean, for example, I've seen parts of England with very big Muslim communities where everyone gets registered for, for a mail-in ballot, to use the American terminology. They all get collected up. They all get filled in by one person. And someone turns up at the polling station with a supermarket carrier bag saying, there you go, there's a 100% vote for Labour. We've seen this in the UK. I'm fighting for reform of it in the UK. I know it was difficult here with the pandemic and ways had to be found to allow people to vote. But to allow mail-in voting on this massive, massive scale without the right checks and balances. I mean, look, the president has a point. It is a disgrace. You know, Nigel, a friend of mine emailed me uh, this morning. He's like, you know, the left, they fight like hell. They're scrappy. They fight when they think they're about to lose. And the right gets their butt kicked and they say, okay, we lost, and they walk away. Why is it the left is so good at, at fighting for uh, the win? Because they believe they have a moral superiority mm -hmm. over those of us on the right, which means they're prepared to go to any ends to achieve their goals. And you're quite right about the apologetic conservatives that we've lived with for decades. But there is one distinction, one difference here. And that's a bloke that you and I know, and his name is Donald J. Trump. And if you think Trump is going to accept this lying down, well, I certainly don't. And if it does turn out that Biden's the next president, you know, normally ex-American presidents go off and drink coffee and play golf. This guy ain't going away you know in in nigel you know leaving leading up to this uh, there were people on the right very very popular names of people on the right including the trump campaign saying look there's going to be a lot of voter fraud and and i felt like they were just kind of like i don't know preparing us for maybe not some good news i'm blown away at the the amount of shenanigans that are going on in state after state after state at one point one state michigan had 130,000 votes come in and were read and, and something like uh, more than 100,000 were, were Democrat. It's just, it's just so, I don't know, scary, icky, gross. Yeah. Um, it, just, it just feels dirty. But, Nigel, it, was, not, but it was so obvious. Yeah. It was so obvious. You know, across the other side of the pond, we've made these errors, and I'm afraid America has walked straight into this trap. And, you know, let's see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, that if uh, the Trump campaign gathers the evidence of intimidation, of fraud... Uh, you know, of, of incorrect verification, uh, that this is going to go into the courts, the Supreme Court, um, and America is going to be paralyzed for a very, very long time, which says 
that the next administration absolutely if it wants to restore faith in the voting system has to put some reforms into place and to do so pretty damn quickly you heard it right there they they've been there did that nigel farage let's not right. fall into that same ambush and trap that you're talking about nigel thank you thank you up next president obama's former economic advisor austin goolsby is here stay with us America, one nation, from Florida to St. Louis to Seattle. America This Week, America's fastest growing political show, delivers facts, not falsehoods. Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I appreciate the opportunity to clear some of it up. Hard edged opinions. We can no longer rely on China to be the primary producer of so many critical products that we need in a time of crisis. Tough topic debates. Has the mainstream media vetted Joe Biden the way they vetted others on the right? I just believe that all women have the right to speak their truth and that those truths should also be investigated. The end, regardless of what political party they are a part of. America This Week reveals the topics and issues that pulse throughout America. Fighting COVID-19. We're working with every single state to be able to detect outbreaks before they spread into the community. And the path forward. Getting back to some degree of normality, that will come. We will get over this. There he is, over here. America This Week investigates chaos at the southern border. Go, 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 go. The poisoning of America. It's in the soils, it's in the water, and it's in our blood. Toxic chemicals linked to multiple cancers found in towns across America. We were poisoned, and we are still poisoned. Almost every day, there is a new community that is finding out that their water is contaminated. America This Week relentlessly seeks the truth on your behalf. I'm Eric Bowling. Join me for a fascinating look at America This Week. I'd like to bring in President Obama's former economic advisor, Professor Austin Goldsby, a good friend of mine, also a really smart guy, except for when it comes to things like elections and politics and the economy. I'm teasing Austin. I'm watching the election returns come in. I'm watching President Trump doing very well. No one expected it. The polls were wrong. But here's also I was watching. I was watching the stock markets rally in overnight trading. Clearly, Wall Street wants a President Trump. Am I wrong? Well, I, th I, I don't know. Um, we, we'd have to go ask who was trading at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I know when it looked like in the polls Biden was going to win, then the stock market went up, and then Trump pulled ahead, and it looked like Trump was going to win, and then the stock market went up, and now we're in this weird nether world where we're waiting on the votes and the stock market went up. So it feels yeah. like the stock market just wants to go well, up. Well, well, let me, let me, and so I, I'm thinking about that as well. And, and cause we, I went to bed at around three in the morning, stock market was up. It went, it went from too close to call. Woke up this morning, a lot of people were saying it was gonna be a Biden win. And here's my point, stock market continued to go up per your point, but I realized it wasn't about who the winner was. It was about who the, the yes. Senate. It was about the, the fact that the Senate was going to remain oh. in Republican hands. So therefore, we weren't going to get those massive Biden tax increases, no matter what, even if he is president. Eh. Man, look, maybe, like I say, well, well, I'm not in the heads of, the, of these you know, billionaire investors, uh, but I do note that before the election, when they started saying, well, if there's a blue wave, then we're going to get a whole bunch of stimulus, the market seemed to like that. And then... If they find out that there's not going to be a blue wave and Republicans are going to retain control of the Senate, then the stock market like that. It is kind of like, you know, your dog wants to go for a trip and wants to come home. You know, it's, it's, the stock market wants to go up. That's what I'm most yeah, it, 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 it definitely has been on, on, a, on a path. But I, again, I think, poli I think policy really drives stocks and the equities and, and you know, the economy going forward and the, and the policy. I mean, how do you... Uh, this is so important, and I know this gets a little wonky. I hope my audience stays with me here, but capital gains. So the investor class, and they, 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 that's basically everyone we're talking to. We're talking to people with 401ks, people who invest in stocks. If, if President Biden 
becomes President Biden, he's going to increase capital gains, almost doubling capital gains. Who in their right mind is going to pay double taxes and go invest in something like that? Instead, go, go put your money somewhere else. Well, when you say somewhere else, I, I, I wouldn't characterize, that's not exactly what the plan is. As you know, Joe Biden wants to cut taxes for ordinary Americans, and the taxes would go up for people making more than $400,000 a year, and only on the part of their income that is above $400,000 a year. No, no, I'm talking, so about, I'm talking about capital gains, that, though, Austin, to, to okay, anyone. But no matter who you gains, are, it doesn't that matter. That applies if you're, if, only. If, if you're a hot dog vendor with, with a 401k, if your if your if your capital if your capital gains short term capital gains profit profiteer okay, you are going to get four hundred one k's don't pay capital gains tax no they're, but if you capital I, gains tax that's free. what I said so I said if you're not a, if you're a hot Nobody's dog vendor if you're a hot dog vendor who bought some yeah. Exxon stock and they get capital gains you're going to go from twenty percent o- only up to if 40%. you make more than four hundred thousand dollars a year you sell a lot of hot dogs if you're going to pay higher capital hey, listen, gains tax hey listen this is hot dog capital of America right here in D C you know no. Wait, Chicago, we love hot dogs. What, what do you? Th- <laughs> so, so you're going to tell me we're going to sit here and talk because we're going to bring you back afterwards and take a look at, at, at whoever. But a, a president Biden is going to be good for the economy. Is this what we're saying? And why? I think he's going to be good for the economy if he's the president. And look, you know, I'm a Democrat. I, I support him. I hope that that Joe Biden wins. I mean, we're, it's still up in the air at this point. I think the focus. We, we didn't have as great a policy focus this election as, as what I wanted. But the policy focus, I thought, should have been Biden's view is stop giving big tax cuts to billionaires and big corporations. Start giving the tax cuts and the investments for, for ordinary workers. That was this kind of his approach that it's not you shouldn't rely on trickle down. When the middle class is strong, that's what's driven growth in the country in the past. So that's why I think he's going to be better for the economy. All, I think the, the, four, <laughs> all four people keeping more of their hard-earned money. By no means do I suggest that I, I, I wouldn't want tax cuts for the middle class. We do. But the people who create jobs, the people who own businesses, the people who take risks, the people who do capital expenditures to expand plants, they have to hire people. They're going to get smacked. And, and we've, we've seen Democrat policies <laughs> hurt that class of people, too. Uh, it, look, I... I I guess I would characterize that logic that you're describing. I I do understand it. That was the logic that Donald Trump said why we should give a $2 trillion tax cut to high income people and big corporations. But I will remind you that that was the most unpopular tax cut in the history of American polling because people looked at it and said, wait, I didn't, I barely got anything. And there's 91 of the Fortune 500 corporations paid zero tax last year, and the president's a billionaire, he paid $750. So uh, I, I think a system like that needs some reform, for sure. All right, Austin, we're going to leave it there. Um, we have a bet, and, and uh, I, I think you and I both have a bet. I, 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 I'm going to leave you on I'm, This is really unfair. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a comment about President Obama, who you work for, and I'm not going to let you answer because we ran out of time. I'm blown <laughs> away, absolutely blown away that President Obama said about Donald Trump on the campaign trail that he, Trump, inherited all the upside of the jobs that, that, that Obama created and the economy Obama created. Yet, when he, he came did. into office, he wanted no part of whatever he was given from George Bush. I mean, that, that, you can't have it both, you can't have it and, and cake and eat it too, Austin Goolsby. Great having you on. We'll see you again soon. Good to see you again, Eric. Straight ahead, Amisha Cross and Dr. Sebastian Garka go head to head over the latest election results. Stick around. We stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one and all. Everyone stands, American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride. Your neighbor needs you, each person, each time. We stand, America. United, strong. we stand. We stand, America. United, strong. we stand. Ready to help. Ready to serve, it takes everyone with steady nerves. Everyone stands, American.
and strong, strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride, your neighbor needs you, each person, each time. We stand American strong. United, we stand. We stand American strong. City by city, state by state, town by town, stand American great. Everyone stands American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride. Your neighbor needs you each person, each time. We stand American. United, we stand. We stand American. United, we stand. Okay, let's bring back our Vote 2020 panel with two editions, Sinclair political commentator Misha Cross, host of the Armstrong Williams Show, Armstrong Williams, member of the President's National Security, Security Education Board, host of America First on Salem Radio and Sinclair Media contributor Dr. Sebastian Gorka, and University of Maryland lecturer Dr. Jason Nichols. Now, this election, we went into this election knowing that race was going to play a big part. Remember what happened all summer long, how race was a big part of this. Going into the election, I want you to listen to Maxine Waters talking about race in the election. For those black young men who think somehow they can align themselves with Trump, not only are they terribly mistaken, any of them showing their face, I will never, ever forgive them for undermining the possibility to help their own people and their own communities. So I'd like to go to Armstrong. Um, how, how do you take that, Armstrong? How do you take that comment? Uh, I, I, it just, it, what, what, let's hear from you. Utter ignorance and Neanderthal and prehistoric thinking. And it reflects to her generation that they're so out of touch. This is probably why Trump got 18% of the black vote, eight men, eight men, and what else? Black women went for 4%, 8%. I mean, it's like a, I mean, it's just shocking. I don't know anybody else. Latinos can vote for whomever they want to, Jews, Asians, white, women, but yet if blacks step out and say, I'm gonna vote conservative, I'm gonna vote this way, all of a sudden they're a sellout, they no longer belong to the tribe anymore. That generation has to die off in order for there to be critical change in this country, because that is a dying voice, and that is why Nancy Pelosi is fighting for her peak speakership today because of the kind of ignorance, and I'm gonna call it exactly what it is, that is ignorance at its best and it should be repudiated at every turn. And Misha, your thoughts? Well, Maxine Waters is entitled to her own opinion. I don't stand by that one. I think that, you know, people can decide who their political party happens to be. And as a black person, I don't think your black card can technically ever be revoked. You wake up black, you're gonna die black. Um, that's not something that is determined by what you, who you subscribe to vote for. I love country music. That doesn't make me any less black than a black person who enjoys R&B and rap. So I, I think that there is some level of offense that can be taken from it, but I also feel as though there's a reason why the African-American voting bloc is largely in the bank of the Democrats. And that is not changing anytime too soon. You know, uh, Jason, last night during their election coverage, MSNBC host, primetime host, Joy Reid, she said, if this election goes to the Supreme Court, do you trust, and she used this word, this, this comment, Uncle Clarence, referring to Clarence Thomas, black Supreme Court justice. What do you say to her? Um, that's not language that I would use, certainly not on television. That's not something that I would say. I think uh, if you want to be taken seriously, you shouldn't uh, say those kinds of things. Uh, but, you know, the idea that Clarence Thomas can't be trusted in, in this circumstance uh, to make a judgment just based on the Constitution and not a partisan one, I think that's that's a fair concern. So I think she's raising a fair concern, but we can do without ad hominem. We can do without the insults. We can we can actually talk about the substance of these issues. Sebastian, earlier today I was on BBC and I was uh, uh, a, a counter to Michael Moore, the, the, the very liberal filmmaker. And basically he said anyone who didn't 
vote for Biden, who would vote for Trump. And he lumped me into this. He called me a white supremacist, or at least a sympathizer <laughs> with white supremacy. And I had to push back because I'm clearly not. And I, I denounce all of that. But, but let's talk about ad hominem. It's the Democrats that seem to be willing to use ad hominem attacks on anyone who doesn't think like them. Absolutely. Cancel culture is not a right-wing phenomenon. It's a left-wing phenomenon. And I, I'm a bit surprised with Amisha. I don't know if she's been asleep for the last six months. She said you can't lose your black card. You wake up black and you go to bed black. Not if you don't vote for Joe Biden. He said if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Quote, unquote. Let's look at what happened in the last 24 hours. The President of the United States, who has been called a racist, a misogynist, a man who plays footsie with the, the Nazis and the KKK under the table earned more votes by five million ballots this year than four years ago. They have tried to smear him and they have failed. And the old tribal constituencies have broken. Armstrong's absolutely right. You look at the Hispanic Latina community in Miami, in Florida. You look at the black Hispanic community in states such as Arizona, they are voting in record numbers, the likes of which we have never seen before for a GOP candidate. That's why the Democrats have to use ad hominem, okay. because their policies have failed minorities. I, I, got, I got 30 seconds each to go around the horn. I'm going to start with you, Amish, because you brought it up. Uh, has, has the black community ignored Joe Biden's comments? No, and I think that the black community has by and large surrounded and wrapped their arms around Joe Biden. We saw it happen when he um, turned everything around in the primaries in South Carolina. We saw it again, uh, not only on Election Day, but dramatically in the days leading up to Election Day through early voting. The black community is a solid block for the Democratic Party and supported Joe Biden resoundingly. What about it, Armstrong? Uh, uh, Sebastian talked about if you uh, vote, if you don't vote for Biden, you ain't black, that and, and countless other uh, comments that would be con considered maybe even racist if it weren't Joe Biden saying them. Your thoughts? You know, the problem here is that to, to think that the only thing that black people are concerned about is racism and civil rights is just such a disservice to that community. They care about the economy, the stock market, they care about foreign policy, they care about education, they care about this pandemic, and all we do is continue to dumb them down, balkanize them, marginalize them. They are Americans first. They're just as American as apple pie and the Chevrolet. Jason? Uh, I, I agree with Armstrong in terms of uh, Americans caring about the pandemic, caring about health care, caring about Social Security, Medicare, and all of those issues. And that's why I think they are going for Joe Biden resoundingly, as, as Amisha stated. As we Jason, see, do you care about unemployment in the black community, by chance? I'm sorry? Do you care about the lowest on record unemployment in the black community under President Trump? Because that that doesn't seem to play in, in your... Well, well, we also know that it went up to 16.8%. We also Pandemic. know it was, it was actually headed in that direction uh, prior to him entering into right. office. I got, I, got to get to, I got to get to Seb. I got 20 seconds, Seb. As I said before, this is the president who has done the most for minority communities since record keeping began. That is just a fact. And if you support him as a black right. American, you get in trouble and you need to be canceled and they want to call you an Uncle Tom and it is a disgrace. Panel. That's the Democrat Party. Thank you very much. Next, she's the national political correspondent for the Washington Post. Amy Gardner is here to talk post-election balls and strikes. America. One nation, from Florida to St. Louis to Seattle. America This Week, America's fastest growing political show, delivers facts, not falsehoods. Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I appreciate the opportunity to clear some of it up. Hard-edged opinions. We can no longer rely on China to be the primary producer of so many critical products that we need in a time of crisis. Tough topic debates. Has the mainstream media vetted 
Joe Biden the way they vetted others on the right. I just believe that all women have the right to speak their truth and that those truths should also be investigated. The end, regardless of what political party they are a part of. America This Week reveals the topics and issues that pulse throughout America. Fighting COVID-19. We're working with every single state to be able to detect outbreaks before they spread into the community. And the path forward. Getting back to some degree of normality, that will come. We will get over this. There he is, over here. America This Week investigates chaos at the southern border. Go, 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 go. The poisoning of America. It's in the soils, it's in the water, and it's in our blood. Toxic chemicals linked to multiple cancers found in towns across America. We were poisoned, and we are still poisoned. Almost every day, there is a new community that is finding out that their water is contaminated. America This Week relentlessly seeks the truth on your behalf. I'm Eric Bowling. Join me for a fascinating look at America This Week. Let's talk balls and strikes. We're joined by the national political reporter for the Washington Post, Amy Gardner. Thanks for joining us, Amy. So let's just give the media, let's talk a little bit about how the media handled this whole election process because these things, yeah, the, the, the whole election is moving day to day, hour to hour. But just how has the media, let's grade the media if, if, if we could. I think it's probably going to start with a grade for the polling. Um, these races are so close in the states right now that um, the polling in the states is going to get a really hard look uh, after we know the outcome. And I think um, the polling certainly informs our approach to the campaigns um, and it in informed the campaign's own approaches. Um, you know, my focus this year was actually not on the horse race and not on the campaigns themselves, per se, but on voting. And so for me, the year was actually a little bit easier to navigate because I was reporting on what was actually happening. I was reporting on how the pandemic had affected the outlook for primaries, what election officials were doing about it, what the campaigns were saying about it, uh, how everybody was preparing for the general election, and then how the vote actually unfolded. So for me, I felt really fortunate to have this universe of actual events and facts to report on over the course of the year. And it was a much harder job, I think, for the campaign reporters to figure out what was going on and what it meant. And, and let's talk a little bit about that. So two, two different campaigns, two different strategies. President Trump was out there, you know, with the big, big MAGA rallies, getting out and people, getting a lot of people together. Uh, Vice President Biden was quieter doing, doing these uh, drive-in campaign events. President Obama helping him out as well. well looks like it's gonna be record turnout for, for the election. Did anyone do anything wrong or just two vastly different strategies? I mean, you know, it's going to depend on who you talk to. President Trump made fun of uh, Joe Biden all year for, quote unquote, campaigning from his basement. And there are quite a few Democrats who actually are rankled about the, can the Democratic campaign's sort of reluctance to get back out and campaign and also the sort of... Um, the, the slow pace of building a, a field operation uh, as we got closer to November, the Republicans didn't hold anything back. They had built a field operation that was really unparalleled and unprecedented in its size and scope back in 2019. And when the pandemic came, they didn't change course. Mm. And so there's certainly going to be some second guessing of the vice president's approach to how to campaign in a pandemic and whether he made the right call sort of being more cautious and whether he even made the right call sort of urging more restraint on opening up the economy because we know now that people really liked the message coming from president trump about keeping the economy going and getting our country back on its feet economically so so let's talk a little bit about what happens and, and the polls started to come out and, and you know, the, the the media generally took the polls as gospel and those who pushed back said, well, yeah, they learned their lesson in, in 2016, so they're better at it this time. They weren't. Um, why does the media rely so heavily on these pollsters? I mean, everybody relies on the pollsters. The campaigns rely on the pollsters, too. Uh, I, I mean, and I also think we have to be a little bit cautious about 
declaring which polls were right and which polls were wrong while states are still counting. Um, it's going to be pretty interesting to see what the, the national popular vote is and whether the polls giving Biden this, you know, big seven, eight, nine, ten point lead over the last several months were accurate because it's too soon to say that those national polls were wrong. Uh, and remember that the national polls were right in 2016 as well. It was the state polls either that missed what was happening, the, the support that President Trump was gathering the lake in the upper Midwest where he ultimately won the presidency, or that because there was a dearth of good state polls. And so this year, one of the things that the media did is actually flood the zone. All the major news outlets did a huge like run of state polls, including us. Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, uh, Texas, you know, and um, and they weren't all right, but we don't know yet by how much. We need to wait and see the count through. Yeah, I want to leave it there. And it, it is noteworthy that the New York Times, they had that meter last, last election cycle, the 2016 the cycle, meter. and they pulled that this time because it is just a moving, fastly moving target with, with polling. And uh, appreciate your time, Washington Post political reporter Amy Gardner. Thank you. Thank you. Remember to set your DVR so you never miss an episode of America This Week. We have a complete list of times and cities on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash America Bowling. And we're also on YouTube. So if you missed the show or want to rewatch an interview, subscribe to our YouTube channel there. We stand, we never fall. This perilous fight, it takes one and all. Everyone stands, American strong. Strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride. Your neighbor needs you, each person, each time. We stand, America. United, strong. we stand. We stand, America. United, strong. we stand. Ready to help. Ready to serve, it takes everyone with steady nerves. Everyone stands, American strong, strength by one equals strength by all. American values, American pride, your neighbor needs you, each person, each time. We stand, American strong. United, we stand. Folks, it's been an incredible and crazy week, and it's only Wednesday. Ballots are still being counted at this hour, and everything may change in a matter of minutes. One thing is certain. It's been an incredible journey just to see how many people voted. Think about this for one second. Estimates say over 150 million people have cast their ballots. That's the largest number of votes ever in U.S. presidential election history, no matter what happens. We should all be proud of ourselves. You should all be proud. You went out and voted. This is what democracy is all about, folks. That's the bottom line there. Have a great night, everybody.
Ahead on a special extended America This Week, 2020 lives up to its reputation as the nation continues to wait to find out who will be the next president. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. And it ain't over till every vote is counted. Every ballot is counted. Voters cast their ballots in historic numbers against the backdrop of a deadly global pandemic. That gave way to the violent riots on the streets. Tonight, our panel will analyze what we know, what we don't know, and what it all means for our democracy. That's right now on a special America This Week, Vote 2020. Thanks for joining us for an extended America This Week live stream at this hour. Joe Biden continues to lead President Trump in electoral college votes, but the race for the White House is still not over. Let's bring in our Vote 2020 panel, Sinclair political commentator Amisha Cross, host of the Armstrong Williams Show, Armstrong Williams, member of the President's National Security Education Board, host of America First on Salem Radio and Sinclair Media contributor, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, and University of Maryland lecturer, Dr. Jason Nichols. And here we are, Sebastian, we're, we're, we're you know, as we speak, President Trump's uh, people have already sent P Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, and in just the last hour or so, Georgia, Notice that they are going to put this out of the hands of the voters and into the hands of the legal experts. Your thoughts? Sadly, this is the only recourse the president has when we see the incredibly suspicious activities uh, last night. Not only the completely unjustifiable call of Fox News with uh, the Arizona vote being given away before 650,000 ballots had been counted. Uh, now we have the four states where the president were leading battleground decisive states as the president was winning, Eric, deciding just to stop counting ballots. Why? Because they want to be in control. They want to get those observers out of there and they want to control the ballots that have been sent in in tens of millions unbidden. Remember, we're not talking about absentee voting where somebody says, I'm traveling, I can't vote, I want a ballot. These are the ones that were sent out willy-nilly by Democrat governors, and this is how the Democrats think they can steal the election. What, is, what do you say, Armstrong? Um, is this a plot to steal the election? You know, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but I must tell you, when 128,000 ballots are dropped in Detroit, Michigan, and every single ballot is 100% for Joe Biden. You have no choice but to think that there's either thievery, highway robbery, uh, that it's just impossible. Yeah. Let me just yeah. be clear. Let, uh, that, but, that cannot uh, happen. Hey, I'm sorry. I think that was an error. I think that was the their decision desk in, in the state of Michigan that made the mistake. They corrected it, but Amisha, they corrected it to a number that was somewhere around 80% for Biden anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, it's great that they issued the correction. Uh, Biden is still overwhelmingly leading there. He was expected to lead very strongly in Detroit. Um, as someone who has worked in Detroit, as someone who has family in Detroit, as someone who knows Detroit very well, this is not a surprising outcome whatsoever. The goal for Democrats in Detroit and in large cities like it, particularly in the Midwest, was to bring out the black vote. Um, those vote totals eclipsed what we saw happen for Hillary Clinton in 2016. And I think that that happened specifically because of the message that Joe Biden was sending to those black communities, as uh, well as several stops from Kamala Harris over the past few months. All right, we'll get to Kamala in a second. But uh, Jason, take a listen to Eric Trump earlier today saying they're not going to take this sitting down. Listen. Um, and we've declared victory in Pennsylvania. We're up by 400,000 votes with 86 percent of the precincts in. 86 percent. We have Republican votes still coming in from Trump country. And the Democrats know that the only way that they could win this election is to cheat in Pennsylvania. And we've seen it from day one. We've seen it from day one. We found ballots in drainage ditches. They're not letting our poll watchers watch the polls. They're not letting them inside. There's video after video of them passing out collateral material in polling sites all over Philadelphia. They're trying to cheat. They're trying to cheat. So, Jason, it's in the hands of the lawyers. I mean, this is this is America's democracy at stake, and we, we sent it to the legal teams. 
Yeah, I mean, that's very disappointing. And, it, and it's really interesting how selective the arguments are. I heard Sebastian say how uh, atrocious it was for Fox News to call Arizona when there are 600,000 uncounted ballots. But there are a million uncounted ballots right now in Pennsylvania, but yet Eric Trump wants to call that race. So uh, I think we should let the process continue, let people count the votes. I think the Trump campaign is 100% within its rights to call for recounts in places like uh, Wisconsin and Michigan that are within 1%. I think they are 100% within their rights to call for that. I don't think it's going to change anything. You're not going to change 20,000 votes. You may change 200 votes, but certainly not 20,000. But they can call for recounts. They can do all of these things. But putting it in the hands of the courts takes it out of the hands of voters. And that's not an election. It's really a travesty. Uh, Armstrong, uh, the state of Pennsylvania going in, when they decided to call it quits for the night, they were going to pack it in, even though this is the most important night of America every four years. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll pick this up tomorrow morning. We need we to go home and get get some uh, a cheesesteak or something. Um, 800, seven or 800,000, ballpark of 700,000 uh, vote lead for President Trump when that happened. We're down to... I think they're down to under 300,000 already, and they just keep counting. It just keeps racking it up. Do you think there, there's any shenanigans? I know you said you're not a conspiracy theorist, but, man, is it, is it that skewed in, in the suburbs of Philadelphia? So, so let me be objective and someone who wants to give the benefit of the doubt. The Supreme Court did give Pennsylvania more days to count their ballots. It's a very stressful situation. It's early in the morning. Sometimes you're not at your best. You can make errors. Maybe they said, in order for the integrity of this process, let's just suspend it, come back when everybody is fresh. It may seem a little weird. Trump was winning. All of a sudden, the dynamics changed. But to give them the benefit of the doubt,